All right. Well, hello to everyone. Um, today you're going to be watching a video lecture on rural settlements and how we divide up the land and um, use it. And so we're going to we're going to kind of start at the beginning and work our way up through um, kind of recent history. But we're going to take a look at kind of how s settlements started and how they people eventually started kind of dividing up that land to use. And so we're going to start kind of with the earliest of cities or settlements. Remember that a settlement, when I use that term, it's a cluster or like a handful, an agglomeration of homes, of, you know, shops, fields. It's kind of basically, if we put it into central place theory, it's uh, a group of central places and the hinterland. Okay? And that's, that's typically what we would call a settlement. Now, AP, they're going to want you to know some of the earliest kinds of these. So we'll talk about what's called a city-state in a little bit. But you might want to write down just a few of these. So in England, you're going to get ones like hamlets, uh, villages. We typically call our smaller settlements towns. And then as they get over a certain threshold of size, then we start to call them cities. But all of these are at different scales uh, examples of settlements. Now, when settlements kind of began, and what I mean by that is as we went from hunting and gathering to agriculture, when we take the step as a species that we can store food, we can mass produce food, uh, when we introduce things like crop rotation or whatever agricultural technology, we're going to get to a point where people can be freed from the burden of farming. And when they're free from the burden of farming, then they're going to do something else, probably something else more enjoyable or something more enriching, uh, more enriching, uh, you know, just something that is better than farming and probably even could possibly make more money than farming or do, be more beneficial to them than farming. So you could be some sort of artisan or, you know, merchant or something like that or, uh, you know, job or role in the government, whatever the case is. Once you start to have people that are not farming, they need to get together at a central location with people who do still produce the food. And so you have this, this necessity then for kind of a central meeting place to exchange goods and services. And um, that's, that's how the settlement is going to develop. Now, almost all ancient settlements, and, and really you could even look today, pretty much every settlement has to need, be near a source of fresh water. And so the earliest civilizations, as they began to develop and grow, they were, you know, pretty much all in river valleys uh, like India. So the Indus River, Mesopotamia between the Tigris and Euphrates. And they, you know, they, they relied on that water source to be able to, to live, um, to, you know, to live as a group. As settlements began to develop and settlements became more complex, um, you had to, and you guys, if you remember when we did our activity, Welcome to the Agricultural Revolution, we, we talked about how, you know, once you start to grow in size, you need granary, you need water for storage, for, you know, for crops, for drinking, and your, your kind of civilization is going to grow to a point where you're going to have certain features about that settlement. So as you look, kind of look on the screen there. You know, typically you're not going to have a, a huge population. We won't have any population of more than a million until after industrialization. So we're talking a couple hundred, a few thousand, uh, you know, before industrialization, you're talking about the, the largest settlements being a couple hundred thousand, whereas that would be just kind of a small city today. That would be the largest ones back then. But some common features that, you know, probably they had a wall to protect what they had. They would have uh, food storage. They would have you know, government structures, some sort of religious structure, some place where people would count and collect taxes, which could have been food or, you know, metal uh, currency of some kind. And then you're going to have a central market. And uh, you might have heard the term bazaar or something like that, but a central market where you can come and exchange goods and services. That would be key to the settlement. And then that area around it where the fields are, where people lived in homes, we know that as the, the hinterland. So like I said, as labor began to specialize, as people freed themselves from the burden of farming, um, you know, 
people grew or made things that would get themselves food, and then they could come together at the market uh, and ex exchange those goods and services. Now, merchants played a key role, especially in getting stuff from other settlements. And, uh, you know, they might bring something that was not grown or was not created in this settlement, uh, brought it from another settlement and exchanged there. And that would be a, a good example early on of a consumer service. Uh, we, we mentioned that some people were working, you know, in various roles in the government. So they could be priests or tax collectors or part of the military to protect from bad people, um, you know, stealing stuff from your, your particular settlement. And all of those people would be considered public services. All right. And then lastly, why settlements develop. So other factors leading to the growth of, growth of a settlement at a specific location. Uh, maybe it was on a good central location for trade or travel, like the Silk Roads. Maybe you were a gateway settlement to somewhere else. Uh, perhaps that you were a settlement because you were next to some sort of valuable natural resource like copper or gold or silver or something like that. So whatever the case, those would be other factors leading to the growth of a settlement at a specific location. Okay, so here would be an example of an early settlement. So I want you to just kind of take a minute to take in uh, a rendering of early Mesopotamia. So this would be in today what we'd call Iraq, but back in those days, this would be part of the Fertile Crescent. So this would be a kind of a typical layout of a settlement. And this would be a kind of an advanced settlement in the Fertile Crescent uh, in Mesopotamia. And so you can see the wall around, and these walls would probably be anywhere from 20 to 30 or maybe even upwards of 40 feet high. Remember that they had to build these by hand, so they didn't exactly have excavating equipment to be able to do this. So they would probably be likely building it out of stone or mud or something like that, some sort of combination. Uh, you can see there's kind of a pyramid looking thing. We would assume that that would be the religious structure. And then kind of, you know, just next to the, the pyramid, you see that big open area. And it's likely that's where you would have your, your central market. So somewhere where you have a lot of space where people can kind of come and go and get the things that they need. Now, every year that I ever show this video lecture, one year I had a, an office mate who decided to plant pictures in my video lecture. And at first I was gonna take them out, but I think they're kind of funny. So I just kind of left them in there. So there you go. You'll see these random pictures every once in a while. All right, here's another one. This one is an artist rendering of Babylon, which also was in Mesopotamia. And you can see with this one, you've got the river actually going through uh, the, the, the settlement. Oh, we got Britney Spears. I'll enjoy it. Go, go Britney. Here's an example of settlements that developed as a result of being on a trade route. And so these were places, uh, you know, along the coast that, that developed so that people could resupply or that merchants could trade stuff and make money. Oh, we got more Saturday Night Live stuff. And then you have the Silk Roads. I'm just curious. I can't remember who's next. Oh, Carlton. There you go. Well, there you go, Carlton. You dance it up, buddy. All right, moving on. So now we have a little bit more complex settlement. And these kind of settlements were called city-states. Now, the earliest city-states formed in ancient Greece. So this is around 450 BC. And they had uh, been prolific enough agriculturally that they could develop a complex, uh, complex kind of social system, um, very stratified socioeconomic ladder where you have people that were very wealthy down to the poor. And these, uh, these people developed, you know, complex cultures. And when we talk about a city state, we're, we're really talking about uh, a multiple faceted city. So not only is the city function as a settlement, but it also really is kind of a country without real borders. Um, and so you, you have this area that's self-governing. They administrate laws over a specific area. So it really functions as a state. Uh, really, the only thing that it's that's missing is, um, you know, typically they don't have borders on a map, but the, you know, the, the, the city itself was a country and it just hadn't developed enough to where 
you had multiple cities that made up a country like we do, but really you take an, you know, Athens is a, a great example of this. So Athens, the capital of Greece, they really function as a city and a country. So that's a city state. Okay, kind of switching gears here a little bit. Um, now we're going to go forward in time here. And really, if you're looking at kind of a, a time period, we would see clustered rural settlements uh, in the earliest times of colonial America. And so I just have to give you just a little bit of background that probably would be helpful. But when people from England came over and set up colonies uh, in the north, especially, so really you're going to see clustered rural settlements in New England. So you'd see these in Massachusetts, you'd see these in Rhode Island, uh, Connecticut, places like that, where when they came over to America, they came over as families. They came over as entire villages and towns, and they effectively set up, um, you know, what they had in old England. So if you take, a, you know, if you take a, I don't know, like a place like Somerville, England, and then they would come over to America and they would call it New Somerville or New Somerville, New England, and they would set up something that was fairly similar to what they had in England. And most of these people that came over to New England, they were what were called Puritans. And Puritans were people that were kind of fed up with the Church of England and they wanted to practice their religion the way they wanted to, free from any kind of control by the Church of England. And so they just kind of wanted to recreate what they had in England uh, in, in America. And they wanted to be together. And so they created these rural settlements where they interacted every day. Whereas typically, if we think of a rural settlement today, a lot of times farmers are very isolated from one another. That would be kind of a dispersed rural settlement. Uh, when the Puritans came over to New England, they wanted to create clustered rural settlements because they wanted to interact every day. And they wanted, to be honest, they wanted to kind of keep an eye on each other because God was important and they wanted to make sure that their believers were not straying off from God's path. And so for a number of reasons, uh, they wanted to, you know, they wanted to be together. Okay. And these these towns, they provided a lot of things. They, you know, they provided goods and services, which is kind of what we're talking, what we've been talking about with the purpose of settlements. Uh, they provided, you might want to write down that they provided defense. Remember Native Americans were in this area and they, they needed to be close together in case they got raided. Uh, they could, they could protect one another. But what I want you to do is I want you to kind of take a look at a typical New England town and you can see that kind of prominent in probably the most central building is probably the, the tallest building in the town would be the church uh, or the meeting hall. And a lot of times uh, that that building was probably, you know, one of the same. So they would run, uh, you know, government in that building. They would oftentimes run church in that building. And it would be sometimes used as a school if they didn't have a school, which this little picture does. But sometimes that that building could be kind of a multi-purpose building. Then you can see some of the other basic things that you would have in the center. You would have what's called a commons or a town common, and that's where animals could graze. You'd typically have like a well so that you could get water. And so it has a lot of the features of the early ancient settlements, just a little bit less guarded in this case. Uh, but then you would have basic services. So I want you to kind of look at the bottom of the picture and you can see services like a school. You can see a cooper. Cooper uh, would be making barrels, barrels to hold water or grain. Then you have like a shoemaker, a blacksmith, and a miller. And so those would provide uh, basic services. You can kind of look around and you can see other services as well. But that's called a clustered rural settlement. And again, this is a New England clustered rural settlement. And so you can see that the houses are pretty close together. Everybody lives in close proximity to one another. And then the, the pastures and things like that are kind of on the outside. You can see in terms of like Von Tunen, you can see that they live very close to the forest. Remember, that would be their main source of energy during this time. Okay, some other examples of clustered rural settlements. This one's outside of the United States. This one would be probably in Africa. So we would see this in, you know, places like Namibia or Angola or something like that, where the people were likely or are likely, if they're still doing this today, um, you know, pastoralists, they're, they're herding animals and they're taking them from place to place. And so they don't put a lot of time into having these permanent settle settlements, but they have them permanent enough 
to where you can see in the middle, always in the middle of these, these are called crawls. So K-R-A-A-L, a crawl is an example of an African clustered rural settlement where you have your animals in a pen in the middle and then you have the housing kind of on the outside and typically you'd have these kind of circular, almost like yurt looking things, uh, but thatched roof houses. And then, you know, you can see on that picture on the left, you have kind of a fence to keep bad people out. It's not like the best fence, but it'll give you a little bit of time. And then, um, you know, when the time comes to where you have to move your animals, then you would take them to another place. Well, this would be another good example of a clustered rural settlement where the houses are close together. Okay, here's some, here's kind of some other ones uh, in the, on the far left, which is what the arrow is pointing at. This is kind of a German version of a clustered rural settlement, kind of like the African crawl. Uh, in the middle, you have a, a French one called a long lot settlement. So let me kind of go to that. So here, the, the long lot settlements, you would see these in, oh, probably like the Mississippi River Valley or anywhere where the French settled. This is a very French thing to do. Whereas if I go back, this is a very England thing to do. These were England's version of a clustered rural settlement. When you get to the long lot settlement, we should be thinking French. Anywhere where you see a long lot settlement, probably the French originally settled there. This is kind of their style of how they divided up the land. So in a long lot settlement, you're, the key to the long lot settlement is the river. And then what you're going to do is you're going to make long, narrow, rectangular pieces. And you can see on the picture there where you'd have your houses kind of in a row there. And so people lived close together. And again, this is why it's a clustered rural settlement. And then you would have your cropland and your pasture for your animals. And then you'd have your forest. And then to get your, to get your uh, energy to cook, cook your food or to, to heat your home. So a couple of good examples of this would be like in Quebec. Uh, you'll see these long lots in places like Louisiana or Des Moines or St. Louis. Again, anywhere where the French were, they tended to divide the land up this way. This is kind of their way of doing it. You can even see that um, even though, you know, obviously things have changed, you can still see remnants of that long lot system. If you look kind of at the center of that picture is a good example um, from, you know, from a satellite image. Okay, now let's kind of switch gears and go talk about dispersed rural settlements. So obviously, if a clustered rural settlement is one in which the, the farmhouses are relatively close together, a dispersed rural settlement is where they're isolated and kind of spread out. You can see in the bottom right hand picture, this would be kind of a typical thing that we would see a lot of places in America where you have this little farmhouse and then it's a quarter of a mile or half a mile before you see another, uh, you know, another barn or another farm. So a dispersed rural settlement is characterized by the farmers living on isolated farms separated by their neighbors in their fields, right? And we need to kind of go back to the beginning when this concept is transplanted also from people in England. But in this case, when the people came over from England, and typically this happened in the South, sometimes in the middle Atlantic states, but oftentimes in the South, they were coming over as individuals. They were not coming over as families like they did in New England. And they certainly weren't coming over as communities like a lot of times they did in New England. Whereas in New England, they're trying to keep that community intact. They're trying to keep that community together because all those people knew each other from England and they wanted to you know, uh, practice their religion at the same church. In the South, typically these people came over as, well, oftentimes individual males in their 20s and 30s. Um, and they, they wanted their own property and they really didn't have a need to be around one another because they were pretty self-sufficient. And so you saw these farms that were spread out and not clustered together. So, like I said, you'll see these in the middle colonies, Pennsylvania, Delaware, up, upstate New York, but you'll, you'll largely see it in the South. Now, this idea really comes from the, you know, the enclosure movement. If you don't remember the enclosure movement, Remember that the enclosure movement is when uh, England started to industrialize. They were going also going through the second agricultural revolution. Sheep farmers, particularly to take advantage of the wool and textiles, uh, they, they started enclosing their land to commercially raise sheep. 
And what this does is it creates these tracts of land, a lot of times discontinuous tracts of land, where people are living kind of isolated uh, instead of you know living together. All right, so we did New England. That was the, the New England town, the clustered rural settlement there. We talked about the South, and we'll kind of come back to the South here in a little bit, and in the middle of Dinah colonies. Now we're going to go out West. And so one of the ways that early America divided up the land in the West, and by the West, I don't mean Oregon, Washington, and California. At this time in the 1780s, when our country began, the West was, as you can see on the picture, Michigan, Wisconsin, Illinois, Indiana, and Ohio. And so when the United States obtained land from England in the Revolutionary War, uh, you know, land was obviously at, at a premium. Uh, a lot of this land was very good treed land, so there's lots of natural resources. And one of the best natural resources that this area had that you're looking at on the screen would be good farmland. And so people wanted to go there and claim that land, and the government said, well, wait a minute. We, you know, we want to make money off of it. We own it. So we're going to not allow people just what we call squat on it. We're going to sell it to them. And so they devised a plan to, to divide up the land and to sell it off and to make money. And that money then helped to go pay off the debt that we had acquired during the Revolutionary War, mostly to France, but to Spain as well. Uh, but the net result of that is the, the imprint or impact that we see on the land, and we can even see it today. So uh, take a look at that picture on the left, and you can see that this is a modern picture or pretty modern picture, and a result of what happened clear back in the 1780s. So whenever you see a, a, a pattern like this, this is the result of what's called township and range surveying. And it was created in the 1780s by the land ordinance of 1785, where they would survey these what they called townships. And a township is basically, um, you know, this this six by six square mile, uh, 36 square miles total, you know, section of, of land that they would turn into what we would call today a town. And so they divided up this town. So I would just go ahead and take a look at uh, one of those. We're going to take a look at the picture on the right. And you can see that there's 36 sections in each township. And each one of those were basically a square mile. And so if we take a look at, I don't know, section 13, um, you know, that that would be land that was to be sold off to a farmer. And then sometimes it would get subdivided. So you can see on the picture on the left of land where it gets kind of subdivided. And you might have two farms on one square mile. But no matter the case, what this does is it sets up for a dispersed rural settlement where people are living isolated because they're uh, you know, spread apart by how they divided up the land. But this is kind of cool because when you fly over, you know, even today, you can see parcels of land that look like this or if I go back that. So try to pay attention. If you don't see a farm that's been taken over by the the center pivot irrigation, if you go over the Midwest especially, you'll see patterns of land that look like this. All right, to end up here, we're gonna talk about something that came out of the enclosure movement and that was meets and bounds surveying. So we need to know that meets and bounds surveying uh, really comes from England. Uh, it comes out of the, the enclosure movement and it was just kind of a way that England had used to divide up the land and then especially in the South. Okay, we need to know that meets and bounds surveying was used almost exclusively in the South by these individuals that came and just, you know, kind of took land and they said, well, this is mine. And so this is how they would do it. They would, they would use typically like a geographic feature. So that's what we kind of want to know is that meets and bounds surveying was done a lot by dividing up land based on geographical features. So creeks made a good boundary. So if I, you know, if I, my property runs along that creek, we would say maybe that my property runs west of that creek, and then we might run my property from a bend in the creek down to a, an oak tree, and then it might go up, you know, here. But, you know, even though you can see that sometimes they use latitude and longitude, a lot of times it was based off ge of geographical features like the, the bendy creek there you can see on the left-hand side. Now, what this results in, if you look on the left, is kind of a chaotic type of land ownership division scheme. Whereas if we go back here, that's very orderly in the township and range surveying in the meets and bounds, you're going to get something that looks kind of chaotic because they're using geographical features 
and not latitude and longitude. It's very clear that the township and range surveying is laid out by taking latitude and longitude, uh, by taking you know right angles and 90 degree angles and stuff like that. Whereas here it's using you know, creeks and trees and hills and stuff like that to, to, to map out what's yours versus what's mine. And remember that this is going to create uh, dispersed rural sediments as well. Okay, all right. So if you miss anything, just rewind and go back, but that should take care of the video lecture for settlements. Have a great day.